Hello and welcome to Introduction to Pneumatology. In some ways, there's a fairly narrow topic in many theology classes and theology books. There's often uh, only a very small amount of space devoted to the Holy Spirit. And yet, when it comes time to teach a whole class on the Holy Spirit, I find that there is way, way, way too much material to try to cover comprehensively. And so we're going to cover all the material we can, more introducing topics and issues and themes that I hope will spark some thinking and continued research on your part. That's what we can do in a quarter system. We can introduce themes and hope and maybe pray that students find enough in what we talk about to press on. So I will be leaving a lot out, even as I have a lot to say, certainly. So three basic topics we're going to cover this week, and let's jump into it. First, an introduction to pneumatology. Pneumatology is, as uh, those with a little experience in theology already know, the study of the Holy Spirit. So pneuma is spirit in Greek. Pneumatology, study of the Holy Spirit. There you go. We could say this is a class on pneumatology. Of course, it would be just as fine, but a little bit alienating to, to those who haven't quite mastered the intricacies of theological talk. By the end of this course, of course you will. So I'll use the term interchangeably, depending on my mood. Pneumatology is, again, the study of the Holy Spirit. Pneumatology is also the experience of the Holy Spirit. So when we come to pneumatology, we're not just discussing a issue or theme that is outside and separate from our own experiences. And so pneumatology can really relate to two different aspects. And we're gonna, as much as we can, try to get a hold of both these aspects through our course. The first aspect is the more conventional way of, of a class lecture functions, where we t we're gonna talk about the Holy Spirit, give uh, themes and issues and ways people have uh, come to terms with what the Holy Spirit does. But to see pneumatology only limited as a discussion about the Holy Spirit is really undermining that very discussion because the core element, as we'll see in Scripture itself, you can't discuss the Holy Spirit really with, without having this experience of the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit work? Well, first we experience the Holy Spirit and then we can talk about this work. Now, of course, someone who's never experienced the Holy Spirit can talk about the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm not rejecting that possibility. But it seems that embedded in the very doctrine is this experiential element that gives uh, a fundamental understanding. That can happen unless someone is in tune with what the Holy Spirit is doing. How did the people in Acts, for instance, understand what the Holy Spirit was about? They didn't sit down and say, well, now let's go and look through and see this is what the Holy Spirit does, and then the Holy Spirit does this. No. They enacted the life of the Holy Spirit in their ministries, and it then reflected on this work of the Holy Spirit and wrote about it. So pneumatology is a study of the Holy Spirit. Pneumatology is also the experience of the Holy Spirit. However, the, the interesting thing about Christian history in the West is that the Holy Spirit really has been left out of a lot of of discussions of formal theology. Now, we, we can't say the Holy Spirit has, has been left out of the Western experience of, of uh, Christianity in itself. The whole, we, we, of course, will say that the Spirit has been present and active in the church and in Christianity in a variety of ways. But formal theology, various patterns over history, has tended to not bring the Spirit up very much. It doesn't, again, it doesn't mean it was, wasn't working. And, and some people even talked about it. But theology develops out of certain questions and issues and themes and structures and a pursuit of coherence then based on different frameworks. And this is an, an intro to theology uh, class like uh, HT 500 or 501 or, or one of those. So I'm not going to get into how, how the, the shaping of theology, but it's just that's enough to say for right now that the trend in theology in the West was to focus on issues primarily related to the being of God as Trinity, and also the person and work of Christ, and issues and doctrines related to specific uh, salvation. 
Now, all of those, of course, relate to the Holy Spirit, but because of the way it was constructed and, and the, the, the pattern of discussions, the Holy Spirit tended to get left out or just added as, as what we might even see as decoration. You, we see spirit language not as a fundamental essence that would actually shift conversations, but more as a way of validating some discussion. But movements continue to arise throughout history. And so one reason why this, the, the spirit language kept both erupting, we can say, in Christian history and also the spirit language tended to be repressed was because you had these movements that would, that would rise up and sometimes were of questionable theological and ecclesial uh, worth. So they were pushed back against and it became easier in terms of organization and leadership to repress some of this language because when the spirit works you tend to get a little anti-authoritarian. Now, now that's not inherent of course uh, but the tendency is to push back against some of the the structures. Uh, this is what the spirit does. The spirit is like wind and the wind can knock things over and if you have a good nice structure or if you're in charge you don't like things knock, being knocked over and it's, it's much easier to create an, a pattern of discipline if you just ignore that element. In contrast, the Christian East to the Eastern Orthodox churches had a strong tradition of a more fully Trinitarian theology. You see the, the, the doctrine of the Father and the Son and the Spirit really not just um, being uh, added elements, but become fundamental elements. They're, the Spirit becomes a key element that does add shifts and points, and they're cognizant of how the Holy Spirit's work does interact in issues of salvation and uh, doctrine of the church and, and throughout. So there's a Trinitarian discussion embedded for uh, the last thousand years. 20th century, however, saw a great revival of interest in the spirit in the West, both in churches, we, we can talk about the Pentecostal movement in the early 20th century, and then later on, really as the, the, this Pentecostal movement exploded through globally, um, part of their influence was bringing this language back in as theologians were were one at first resistant and it wasn't an academic movement uh, at first but then they started realizing that there was a fundamental critique that Pentecostal churches were offering in how Western academic theology was coming together and so especially in the last 40 years there's been a massive revival of discussion of the Holy Spirit. 40 years ago, would be hard, you'd be hard pressed to find a focused discussion on the Holy Spirit in a systematic theology. Whereas in the last uh, 40 years, it's been increasing. And then in the, in the last um, 10 to 15 years, it become, it's, it's really present. So we can't really even talk about a lack of discussion of the Holy Spirit, given the explosion even throughout the realm of theology. The, these resources, this renaissance of pneumatology, ha hasn't just said, now let's say something new. It's really tried to go back into scripture and say, it's not that we're, the Spirit is doing something new in our era, it's that we've ignored the teachings that we've been given. And we've, been, we've ignored the threads that, that have happened throughout history um, and, and theological movements. And we, we've just, we, for whatever reason, decided to put those off to the side. And now we're realizing that we can't do that that, uh, that a, a Christian theology that lacks uh, discussion of the Holy Spirit isn't a fully Christian theology. Simply because it talks about Christ is, is great, but embedded throughout the New Testament is an integrative, transformative discussion of the Spirit as well. And if you take the Spirit out of a discussion of soteriology, if you take the Spirit out of a discussion of sanctification, if you take the Spirit out of a discussion of ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, you're going to have misshaped doctrines because the spirit isn't just a little bit of religious sounding language or decoration. It's not just tinsel we throw on the theological tree. The spirit is, is key to every element of Christian theology. So this class is really about this history. How, how, how can we see the spirit working? It's also about the developing insights as we look in different directions and uncover some of where the discussions are happening again, more introductory rather than comprehensive. And we continue to point towards continued discovery of the work of the Holy Spirit. And again, going back to what at the top of the slide, this isn't just simply about the study of the Holy Spirit. It's about the experience of the Holy Spirit. So I'm inviting you 
to in the forums and however we we can sort it out to contribute back how i want you to wrestle with your experience of the holy spirit i want you to wrestle with not just in a uh, positive way but what what are ways in which uh, we find difficulty in this what are critiques we can have about different movements this is a class to sort through the complicated study and experience of the Holy Spirit so that as we go into churches or whatever, wherever our ministry may, may lead us vocationally otherwise, we'll have a stronger sense of discernment. How can we understand the Holy Spirit's work in our lives? How can we see the Holy Spirit's work in the church? Can we see the Holy Spirit's work beyond the church? These are complicated and yet necessary questions in our era. So as I said, there's a current renaissance of the spirit in theology and spirituality. Theologian Elizabeth Dreyer says this, that there's renewed interest in that's visible in at least three contexts. One, renewed interest by your individual Christians who hunger for a deeper connection with God that is inclusive of all of life as well as the needs of the world. It does this, does Christ's work only lead me into a individualized experience of salvation that is about getting to heaven? In past generations, there's been, if that hasn't been formally expressed, there's sort of been this assumption that that's true. Now, we're realizing that that, that really isn't part of the biblical narrative. That when Christ saves us, we're saved into a community. And when Christ saves us, this isn't a in process in which we wait for the bus to come to take us to heaven. It's the beginning of a new life. A revitalized life that deepens us into the experience of the world just as Christ himself and was incarnated fully into this world. Second, the church that seeks to renew itself through life-giving disciplines and a return to sources. So the church is broadly, not just in Pentecostal circles, but broadly throughout these very traditions, seeing the necessity of a active embrace of the Holy Spirit as a way of becoming a true community. The, the Acts community was, we can say the church was birthed because of the Holy Spirit and enacted by the power of the Spirit that, that went from this room in prayer, then outward into the streets, this breathing in and breathing out of churches, life that was so radically transformative in the setting. Well, when, in an era in which there's a sense of dryness or a sense of incompleteness or a sense of, you know, over-programmed, and a sense of this narrow vision of what Christianity is, we realize that part of the problem isn't simply that people are rejecting the church, it's that the church hasn't really fully been the church in as much as it hasn't understood the Spirit's work in its context and in its people. And third, the, there's continued renewed interest in, in academic philosophy and theology. As I said, there's been a massive blossoming of, of focused discussions and inclusive discussions across the globe interested in reintegrating the Holy Spirit throughout the systematic theology, not just in its own separate topic, not just in how does the Holy Spirit do dynamic things and specific issues, but how does the Holy Spirit affect our understanding of various issues, themes, concerns, and go down the list. We, we realize that Theology needs an integrated doctrine of the Spirit. And to do that, we don't have to quite start over, but we do have to maybe break down some of the walls and barriers and critique elements that are missing this. And that is a big task, to be sure, but also an exciting task. As we can say, because of this, theology really is in one of its most creative eras in the last 1500 years. There's a lot going on theologically as we realize the new vistas that we're opening. It, it, not everything has been said. So let's talk about the place of pneumatology in systematic theology. In, in typical uh, approaches, traditional approaches, there's not a separate chapter on pneumatology. If, if you look back through um, systematic theologies written up through the, the even to the end of the 20th century, you, you may not even find a, a chapter on the Holy Spirit, which is unusual, right? Because we, if we talk about the Trinity, you think we talk about an element of Father, Son, and Spirit, but so often it's left out. Even the title of the theology courses at uh, Fuller Seminary reflect of this. The HT 500 and HT 501 um, talk about God and Christ in theological or, or historical perspective. Well, where's the Spirit in that? I mean, I, and when I teach these classes, I include the Spirit in that discussion, but 
Christ gets his own separate mission, and oftentimes we use God to reflect the Father. That's not precise theological language. But where does the Spirit fit into this? And often the Spirit, again, is left out. The, it's not the Spirit is entirely removed. Usually the Spirit is interwoven with other theological topics, such as the inspiration of Scripture, soteriology, um, which is the, the subjective, how do we experience salvation, and in some talk, topics as ecclesiology, which is indicative of the idea of how the Holy Spirit early has been folded into an understanding of the church. And we'll get into that in a little bit when we talk uh, about the filioque concern where the, the, the Spirit was put beneath the third in ranking of the Spirit, and in part of that became simply a additional doctrine of the church where the church was there was assumed the the spirit the, the spirit gives us scripture so we don't need to talk about separate issues of the spirit because sp the scripture is this continued discussion um, and it was all folded together and yet that doesn't seem to be enough so Grinz's uh, Theology of, uh, for the Community of God which is a textbook that Fuller used for many years in his classes and continues to be a wonderful resource and yet, uh, he's, there's not a separate chapter on the Holy Spirit, even as he constructs this really wonderful understanding and integrative and dynamic understanding of the, of the place of community throughout the, the Christian discussion. In comparison, the, the text that's used throughout the, the required theology courses here at Fuller, An Introduction to Christian Theology um, by Plantinga, Thompson, Lund and Lundberg, does have a chapter on the Spirit. So in, w within... Uh, 15 years or so, you can see how theologies, even those that aren't coming out of Pentecostal traditions, are increasingly realizing the need to have separate chapters. And part of that comes out of the idea that the theological monograph, separate books, enough has been written about the Holy Spirit that really now will feed into their own separate chapters. Spirit is increasingly recognized as a distinct of course not separate person and theologians are realizing how truly systematic theology it, true the, systematic theology can't just use the spirit as decoration so what difference does understanding the role of the spirit make in our theology what difference does it make in your theology what difference does this make in your ministry that's an important question and it's worth pausing and thinking about this does the doctrine of the holy spirit make a difference not only in a worship service but does it make a difference in how you understand all the various issues and concerns relating to Christianity? Does the doctrine of, your, of the Spirit make a difference in how, for instance, you understand a lot of the civil rights issues that are going on? Does the doctrine of the Holy Spirit make a difference in how you understand how you would talk to someone who is in a different religion? Does uh, uh, understanding the role of the Spirit make a difference in how you structure your church? or how you see your own involvement in the church. And th those the specific questions could go on and on, but does it make a difference? If you took the Holy Spirit out of your theology, would anything change? For a lot of Western history, you could really take out a doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Most everything would really have a fundamentally same phrasing and construction. Now that's a problem because the third person is f as a fully person can and should make a difference, but what difference does it make? It's a question we'll walk through through this class. In the early creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the, the mention of the Holy Spirit is part of the third article that deals with the church, forgiveness of sins, eschatology. Later theology, the Spirit was connected mainly with the second article, Christology and salvation. How we discuss the Holy Spirit, where we see the Holy Spirit work, what place we give the Holy Spirit in uh, our understanding of theology and ministry really does then push back at us to shape and frame in certain ways, and sometimes in ways that make us uncomfortable, or leave a little more flexibility or uncertainty than we're comfortable with. So oftentimes in the West, especially, it's been easier to place the Holy Spirit in a, in a, in a way that is a fair bit more safe. Holy Spirit is good, but the Holy Spirit isn't necessarily safe, and that causes some tension especially when you add to the idea that a lot of throughout history people who claim they're following the holy spirit really have completely left christian teaching together so the holy spirit language has been used to justify heresy or bad behavior which is why we we really want to emphasize a discernment of the spirit in this process 
So all theology is contextual. Some approaches to theology are intentionally contextual and focused on a specific theme or experience. This is worth noting in every theology class because the tendency has been to, to call these contextual theologies that happen in the other places, well, standard theology, which, which is, comes from uh, mostly Europe uh, of the 20th century or earlier, the Enlightenment European theology is somehow seen as conventional. And so you have like uh, the, the very titles, Latin American theology or feminist theology, will show the or so called contextual, well, the uh, creatively named systematic theology or systematic theology or systematic theology. All three of those are by three different authors, and I could go on and on having the same topic. They're seen as this, uh, this is the objective theology. Well, that's not true. All theology is contextual. And yet, some theology is, like Pennock's book is doing, intentionally approaching the theological questions through a specific lens, experience, or question. And so we, it's, it's still worthwhile understanding how these lenses or, con, or, or, or experiences or questions shape then some specific nuances of theology. And the spirit has been continued to be a fruitful discussion in these more focused discussions. So in, in, in addition to the traditional pneumatologies, trying to adapt the conventional models with, with an embedded pneumatology like Pannenberg is doing, you have a lot of new developments in, in feminists and other women's pneumatologies. You have a lot of liberation pneumatologies like Latin America and, and, and Africa that are that are approaching it from socially and politically oriented interpretations. Uh, a lot of what are called green or what, what I term eco pneumatology that, that are focused on how is the Holy Spirit working in the environment and how should this affect our response to these issues. Pneumatologies from Asia, Africa, America, um, which in, in America is in terms of indigenous and also contextual, different kinds of experiences in the Americas lead to different kinds of discussions. It's not that these are somehow lesser or, or somehow uh, subjective while there's other objectives. It's just that when you come to certain topics, you're, you're in, it's worthwhile saying, well, these are my issues and concerns and questions, and these are the problems I'm seeing. Some, some are trying to build a pneumatology from the ground up, and some are saying, poking at these uh, pneumatologies and saying, well, here's some friction here. Here's where it's not quite as coherent. And also, pneumatologies address the theology of religion's issues the relation of Christian faith to other religions. The, the Carcanon texts that I'm using in this class really bring uh, a lot of these together. And uh, even though he's a, uh, a European male himself, he's really uh, helpful in bringing a lot of voices into this discussion and integrating these in, in a way that's, that's really unique in a form that doesn't require me to assign 30 different books. <laughs> Uh, I encourage you to read those books, mind you. I have them listed in the, uh, the recommended reading, but we, it's, it's worthwhile to see that these discussions also in a way that's uh, approachable for class. Okay, biblical perspectives on pneumatology. Bible doesn't present a systematic theology of the Holy Spirit. Bible doesn't present a systematic theology of anything. Uh, we, we try to take the Bible and boil it down to certain points that can answer certain questions and issues and create a coherent discussion based on what we think is important in our era. Everyone's done this through different eras. Div different eras have different questions. So we have, we have uh, creeds like the Nicene Creed that are shaped according to the kinds of questions and issues and concerns they had. Well, we have different questions and issues, and so there's always these discussion drawing from scripture, drawing from reason. And yet, if we go back to the Bible itself, a lot of what we think is systematic or what we, we, we know about God isn't necessarily spelled out there. The Bible speaks of narratives in terms of symbols, images, metaphors, testimonies. The Bible gives us this discussion of God that then we're left to wrestle with because God often isn't concerned about our questions. Remember the story of Job? Job says, why have you done these things? And God is these, this, like, he accuses God of treating him uh, unjustly. And he brings God to this great court, essentially. And God defends himself. Well, what does God say to Job? Have you created the mountains? Have you created the trees? Have you created the clouds? Do you know how much rain there is? Do you know what swims in the ocean? Basically, he tells Job, you, you can't even understand the, the question, let alone the answers. I have no reason or need to justify myself to you. And yet he honored Job. 
He honored the question, so it's not negating the idea of asking the question. It's just the idea that God isn't presenting himself in a systematic way because that's not necessarily his concern. What is his concern? That's the question we're asking throughout seminary, isn't it? Metaphors of the Spirit include wind, dove, water, these dynamic elements that are hard to contain. They appeal to as much imagination as to, to reason. We, we don't have these clearly, now this is the four things the Spirit does, or these are the, now this is how we can connect the diagram between Father, Son, and Spirit. We're not given that. We're given these ways of enlivening understanding that goes beyond a, a text. A picture is worth a thousand words, as the saying goes. Well, so the Bible gives us these images of the Spirit that, that propel us outside of our ability to put it into language, and it gives us a conceptual beginning so we can begin to organize our understanding. doesn't mean we can't be systematic. The Bible does invite that, I think, and we see the Spirit doing that, and yet but we can't expect the Bible to give us these nice bullet point answers. Wouldn't, wouldn't life be easier if the Bible just you know said, here's the, here's the list of 10 things? Well, no. It would be easier, but it wouldn't be inviting us into the relationship of God. It would be easy to, if you get married to have the list of these are the 10 things you do, and if you do these 10 things, then everything's going to go right. Well, anyone who's been in any kind of relationship knows relationships are a lot more complex than that. You can do everything right, but there could be some twist or turn, or you do the right thing, but in the wrong way. There's a complexity in relationship. Well, God's inviting us into relationship, not just an understanding about him. And the Spirit then is this presence of relationship. Well, how can you boil that down? But at the same time, you ha the way our mind works, you have to at least construct some way of organizing it. Basic biblical terms, ruach, which is a fun word to say. In the Old Testament, a pneuma in the New Testament carries similar ambiguity of breath, air, wind, or soul. Whereas the English spirit tends to suggest that, you know, something more like the soul, or as reflected in older translations, ghost, it's a very different kind of word than what ruach and pneuma mean. Now, to add a little bit of complexity, is ruach is feminine in Hebrew, grammatically, and pneuma is neuter, grammatically, in Greek. Spiritus is masculine in Latin, which, which now affects the discussions. So what gender do we give the spirit when we're discussing? What pronoun do we use? Well, uh, Clark Pinnock gets a little bit into that, and we're not going to talk about that deeply, but I'm just going to show it. There, there's a complexity to even what pronoun we use, depending on what language uh, we're starting from. The elusive nature of the way the Bible refers to the Spirit should be taken into consideration when, when developing any kind of theology. We have to be careful about doctrine of the Spirit that we don't so narrow our understanding of the Spirit that we say this is what the Spirit can do and this is what the Spirit can't do. Well, maybe there are ultimate boundaries, but the Spirit is free. The Spirit does what the Spirit wants to do, which is the book of Acts, right? Should Gentiles be allowed in the church? Well, let's have you know a 10-point discussion and get together people and, and sort through. Well, the Spirit just fills Cornelius with, with gives him the gift of tongues, and the, the Spirit's already working, and the church has to catch up. So we have to be careful, even in our era, that we don't constrict the Holy Spirit, and in constricting the Holy Spirit, we're rejecting what the Holy Spirit is actually leading us to do. But at the same time, we, don't, we shouldn't be so open to the Spirit can do anything that we lose any sense of discernment, because the Spirit also is always drawing people into a relationship with Christ. The Spirit isn't just this nameless force that is just a way of baptizing whatever we want to do and giving us freedoms just to do whatever we want. The Spirit is organized in the context of God's holistic work. The Old Testament doesn't contain an explicit understanding of the Trinity, so we, we, we shouldn't read the mentions of the Spirit as being expressions of the third person of the Trinity, and, and notice even the capitalization issue. For the Old Testament, spirit is more of an expression of God, the activity of God. They didn't see the spirit as a separate uh, person. They saw it more like the hand of God, God's hand, God's expressive inaction in a specific issue or place. So to reflect this, when I talk about the spirit in the Old Testament, I tend to use the lowercase s. Now that's not saying that we can't theologically use the Old Testament for understanding the spirit better. We can. I mean, this is a theology course, so we're not limited to some of the usage that we might do if we're trying to say, well, what did the uh, prophets mean when they were writing about the Spirit? What was in their mind? Well, we can, we can stretch that out, which is why I like theology. We can say, well, um, we use the, the discussions of the Spirit in a way that seem to be 
understood by the New Testament authors. We see, we read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament because we say God is Trinity. Jesus is the Son. The Spirit is this revelation, and we have this whole Trinitarian discussion that, that derives from that. And so we can say, well, how is the Spirit understood in the Old Testament? And the Spirit was understood in the Old Testament. The Spirit is present, and present in a way that I argue, and others argue, is consistent with what we also see in the New Testament. The Spirit wasn't doing a new work in the New Testament, if we understand how the Spirit worked in the Old Testament. And yet, we need to realize that that wasn't necessarily how the Old Testament writers would have themselves described it. The New Testament writers did construct their discussions in continuation of Old Testament revelation. They saw themselves as part of this continuing narrative. They didn't see that you have the Old Testament break, stop, start over, New Testament. They saw Genesis creation all the way through the end of the Old Testament and a fluid entry into God's work in Jesus as a continued revelation of God's holistic salvation, God's mission that continues throughout history. So they reflect the language and ideas and themes in their discussions that had an integrative connection with, with the prophets, with what we see in Genesis and Exodus and the, and the Spirit. So what does the Spirit do in the Old Testament? Let's talk about that for a little bit. Again, ruach means breath, wind, spirit. It's a fun word to say. If, if we were in a class, I'd have everyone say it together, right? Stop for a minute. Just say ruach, ruach. See, it's fun. You have to have the little back of the throat thing. Uh, general, uh, spirit of life. The, the spirit is the spirit of life. Where the spirit is, there's life. When the spirit is removed, life doesn't continue. We see this in Genesis 6.3, 6, 6.17, 7.15. I'm not going to stop and read these, but I encourage you to, to pause and look these over. So there's a relationship to life itself. The word primarily is translated as breath, but breath used in a theologically interested way. The, writers, uh, in, the writer in Genesis intentionally blended this word. So we, we can talk about God's breath giving us life. God's breath gives us breath. God's spirit gives us spirit. There is an overlapping sense of God's presence giving us the essence of what it means to be alive. The source of God's life is, is that God is with us in a specific personal way. So life itself seems to be an indicator of the presence of the spirit of God. When the spirit is removed, life is removed. When the spirit is given to whatever the spirit is given, life is enacted and so we can see echoes of this later on the trees will cry even the rocks the dry bones will be right can be raised up god can give life to wherever he wants and god can also remove his presence so wherever there is life there is an element of the general work of the spirit because it wouldn't be alive if the spirit wasn't enlivening it creation is imbued with this presence of the spirit that's not to identify god with creation god is above and beyond god is a creator but we also need to see that god is present in creation in a way that transcends a lot of uh, conventional understanding the created world is apart from the being of god those places that god animated into life are points at which god has entered with his spirit and so we should treat accordingly so again the idea of the spirit in the old testament is a spirit's role in creation as the principle of life the life force now this is central to a lot of conventional understanding in today in, in a lot of current theology like pannenberg and Moltmann and uh, Velker and others, are, the idea that the spirit is the spirit of life really becomes a fundamental element of how they develop their discussion. And it's, it's, a, it's an absolutely biblical concept that is foundational to then late, later discussions. So this principle of life ex then extends dynamically into particular situations. And so the spirit is always the spirit of life and in specific ways at specific moments brings this power of life into a dynamic way. The points at which the spirit works then can be seen as making a person more alive. When a person is filled with the spirit, it's not that they have this added force that somehow uh, takes them over. They're not being possessed. They're enlivened. They become more alive. When we use our gifts in the spirit, we become more alive. We become more of who we are. When we're saved by the spirit, it's not that we're now pulled out of our, our humanity. We're created to be more human than we ever were before. 
The Spirit enlivens us. The Spirit enlivens a context. The Spirit enlivens situations. And in giving life, creates a dynamic interplay of the various participants in a new and powerful way. The resurrection, the Spirit's work of providing life, the we, we, people raised from the dead, but also people doing a lot of other gifts, hospitality, leadership, teaching, all these are expressions of a giving of life in the power of life itself. So we can see a general element of the Spirit's work, life, and a particular element in specific situations and with specific people, even in the, in the Old Testament. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of the stories and, uh, and specifics. I just want to say enough to show that if you read the Old Testament in this lens, you start seeing the Spirit language in a lot of places. For instance, Genesis 41, 38, Exodus 31, Numbers 11, 17, Deuteronomy 34, 9. Illustrations of the Spirit's work. We can go beyond and look at the way the Spirit worked in the prophets and in the, the histories. But I encourage you, look at these passages, look at the surrounding context and see and read them and realize, hopefully, that what we see in the New Testament isn't entirely a new work of the Spirit. Yes, it's expanded, it's broadened. We can talk about uh, new elements of this, but this is a consistent work of what the Spirit has always been doing. As a charismatic power, Ruach can come mightily upon a human being. Genesis 14, 6, 1 Samuel 16, 13, and clothe him or, or him or her to equip for powerful works, including release from threatening powers, to give prophetic visions. Uh, we, we can even, some of the language and very really used is, is to f be filled. So Bezalel and Aholiab in Exodus 31 and 35 are talked about being filled with the Holy Spirit, like a cup is being filled with liquid. Spirit can bring about the craftsman skill. The first spiritual gift identified in the Bible you make pretty things, you do artistic crafts, and you also teach. But also, we can also talk about any outstanding ability, uh, a dynamic ability to fulfill the task at hand. What is needing to be done? The Spirit gives the insight or power to do that thing. It's not just a craftsman skill, for instance. It's understanding the depths of the blueprint of God's intention and understanding that having the ability to carry it out. The prophetic books see an integral connection between the Messiah and the Spirit. The Messianic figure is anointed and empowered by the Spirit of God. Isaiah 11, 1-8, 1 uh, 42, 1-4, 49, 1-6. So there's three times in which the verb to be filled with the Spirit is used. One is Bezalel um, in Exodus 31. Another is with Joshua. He's filled with the Spirit to carry on the leadership of Israel into the Promised Land. And then you have the Messiah filled with the Spirit to carry on the mission of God. God gives a new spirit to heal, to restore, again, enliven. Hosea 4.12, Ezekiel 18.31, Joel 2.28-32. In the wisdom literature, wisdom can be correlated or identified with the Logos or the Spirit. So we see this dynamic interplay where you can connect both to, to read a Trinitarianism back into the Old Testament, connect uh, Christ and Spirit into this and see how these personifications, essentially, now carry on in a, a consistent understanding in the New Testament. As I noted before, as we go into the discussion quickly of, of the New Testament, it's important to emphasize that the Spirit in the Old Testament is the Spirit in the New Testament. Again, the Old Testament writers would not have expressed it as the third person of the Trinity, but the New Testament writers clearly understood the correlation. They clearly saw what was happening in their time as a continuation of what God was doing. The New Testament wasn't a radical change as it was a fulfillment an expansion, a deepening, a broadening, a revitalization of the continuing mission of God. It's a continuing testament of God's work, and it's a continuing expression of the Spirit that worked in general and particular ways in the Old Testament and continues this work in a confirming manner in the life of Jesus, and then in a confirming manner in the life of the early church. They saw the Spirit as evidence of God's favor and God's power in bringing a renewal from within the context. The New Testament writers knew the Old Testament. They see the Spirit of God continuing this grand narrative of redemption, renewal, transformation. The Spirit Christology of the Synoptic Gospels clearly highlights this. Jesus' birth in Matthew 1, 18-25 and Luke 1, 35. What's the first work of the Spirit? In the, in the New Testament, the Spirit conceives Jesus. 
The Spirit sends forth Jesus. It, the, in baptism, we see the, the Spirit descending upon Jesus. And this isn't just a random experience. This is the inauguration. It's usually seen as, as part of his ministry. Jesus is inaugurated. What is the first thing the Spirit does in Jesus' ministry? She, he, the Spirit sends Jesus out into the wilderness. There's a good lesson, right? Sometimes when the Spirit works in a powerful way, it's not, it's not this big, dynamic, dramatic expression. This, sometimes the Spirit sends us out and away for training, reguiding, uh, facing of temptations. Uh, but then we also have ministry with healings, exorcisms, other miracles as, as being functions of the Spirit as part and parcel of Jesus's work and life and ministry. It's in, the Spirit is indicative of the eschatological ministry in the role as baptizer in the Spirit. So the Spirit sends Jesus, but Jesus also sends the spirit there's a mutuality in this and in the works of john the johannine pneumatology we can see a, a very distinct and unique contribution to this the tradition picks up again continuing the old testament images of the spirit related to the life-giving power of water breath and the metaphors of rebirth so we see this in john 3 5 through 8 the spring of life and the work of new creation the spirit is enacting enlivening starting afresh in all the broad imagery that the ring springs to mind. There's an anointing we see in 1 John, which is another aspect of old, the Old Testament. John is intentionally bringing in these Old Testament themes as this consistent confirmation and affirmation of, of the work of Jesus. Jesus has been given the Spirit without measure, so all that the Spirit does is within Jesus, which might be a distinction we see from what we see in the life of the church, for instance. The Spirit is given gifts to each person so that as a community, we're expressing expressing the fullness of the, of the work of the Spirit. Well, Jesus was himself fully expressing the fullness of the Spirit's work, so all the gifts could be seen in Jesus. We are the body of Christ, then, right? The, Jesus' gift of the Spirit is tied to Jesus' death. Jesus, in dying, you know, the Spirit goes away. In the resurrection, is the Spirit is renewing and giving life again. But then when Jesus ascends, so it's really more that it's tied to Jesus' ascension. When Jesus ascends, it's only when Jesus goes back to the Father that the Spirit is given. So this, the Spirit that is with Jesus in full, without measure, is then given to the church fully. If Jesus says, if I don't go away, then you wouldn't have the Spirit. It's better that you have the Spirit. So I'm going to go be with the Father. Now there's some interesting theology. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a lot of depth and content in some very quick verses. The most, one of the most distinctive elements is the introduction of the Spirit as a paraclete, the other paraclete. Jesus teaches. Jesus guides. Jesus is the Messiah that the, the disciples sit with and learn from, ask questions from. Well, then Jesus goes to the Father, th then the Spirit is sent and fills this world. What is it that, G that the Spirit does? Jesus will remind them of all Jesus taught and what he did. If we want to know anything about what God wants, we have the Spirit. The Spirit is our source, our counselor, our advisor, we can say. The term paraclete means one called alongside to help. So we can, the, that imagery can be used in a lot of different framework. What kind of help do you need? We can have advocate or defense attorney, someone who defends us, defends the cause, gives us some, some right way to argue a case, or guides us, a counselor in terms of psychology, or a life coach, to use current terminology. In the book of Revelation, broadening the, the Johannine uh, scope, the spirit plays a crucial role in inspiration and vision. The apocalypse mentions seven spirits, or the spirits of Jesus, Phrases typical of apocalyptic literature broadly. Gordon Fee, in his uh, great work, God's in Power and Presence, argues that every time the word pneuma is used in the letters of Paul, and I think maybe arguably beyond, there's always implying not just a general spirit, but a the presence of the Holy Spirit. In the early church of Acts, transforming power of the Spirit is evident in the origins and life of the earliest Christian communities. We see this broadly and dramatically on the day of Pentecost with a powerful outpouring of the Spirit, fulfilling the prophecies of Joel, and the reception of the Spirit taking place with visible signs. The signs of speaking, not only speaking in tongues, but also hearing. Peter, when Peter spoke, everyone could hear him in their own language. So it wasn't just, it, it was this broad communicative expression. These were signs that taken as evidence. How do we know God is working here? Well, look at the work of the Spirit. That's how we know. That's the, that becomes then a fundamental argument. Is God in this thing? Well, here's a valid expression of this. Now, it's worth noting that in light of these valid expressions, people, 
as people are, also try to mimic valid. So it's not just the expression of some kind of act. Is it, is this a truly valid expression or are, is there some, you know, smoke and mirrors going on? We, we have Simon the Magician trying to pose with this power and, and early Christian literature, just that he, he made quite a name for himself as this prophet and miracle worker using spirit language as some kind of promotion for him. It wasn't in tune with the spirit of Jesus or the spirit that was being preached by the early church. So we have to be careful of counterfeits, even as we also have to affirm the presence of real works of power and dynamic expressions of the spirit that do confirm God's work. At pivotal moments in the life of an individual or church, the Holy Spirit was looked on as a source of extraordinary power. What needs to be done? What answer is God doing? What sign does God want? So the Holy Spirit isn't this vending machine where if you put in the right coins and put in the right words, then it'll pop out the right thing. The Holy Spirit is always contextual in doing that which needs to be done to point the mission or experience or context in the way God wants it to. The, the Spirit isn't our genie. And yet the Spirit also isn't just a passive way of talking about the church's work. The Spirit will do dynamic expressions when the Spirit is seeking to do that for some specific reason. So we can talk about this, these dynamic experiences and acts in, in, in global context, but uh, for many of us, we don't see these as much today. Well, that's not necessarily saying the Spirit can't do it. It's that for whatever reason, in light of our mission and context, that's not necessarily what the Spirit is intending to do, though sometimes it is, which is, which is a continuing discussion. Another means by which the Spirit helped the early church was to give special authority to the leadership of the community. So there was there was an enacting of vision, a work of leadership, a gift of leadership. Now, again, we have to be careful. We, we can't just say just because someone is a leader or has a role, that is the sign that they are walking with the Holy Spirit. I've, I've encountered pastors that said because they had this role, that then is the confirmation and they get to do whatever they want, which leads again to danger and heresy and all sorts of problems. It's the empowering of the Spirit to lead in the direction of the Spirit, to live out the way that God would have us work. Jesus himself enacted this. Not He didn't see Godhood as something to be pursued, but he let go everything. So the servant nature of it, the method of the leadership that is in tune with the whole community's work. If a leader is negating what the Spirit is doing to the community, then they're not in tune with the Spirit. And yet, there are people who are given special roles of leadership. Again, an issue of uh, discernment, directing the work of missionaries in context. There's spirit-oriented ecclesiology. Who do we include in the life of the church? How do we discipline? Where do we know when someone's going wrong versus where they're lead leading us in a prophetic direction? How do we construct an early understanding of the church based on discernment of the spirit more than any other factors? The church in Acts was highly responsive to these cues in a way that seemed to provide some balance. We, we see the, the uh, council in Jerusalem navigating how do we include uh, Gentiles and yet later on as the church grew and it became more complex and some more problems arose they tended to diminish this more dynamic charismatic element of the spirit and, and just say as leaders we have been endowed with the spirit again there's not a binary here there, there's a complexity of discernment that we have to engage in Paul Paul also has a spirit Christology Jesus was raised to a new life by the Spirit. The Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Therefore, it's only through the Spirit that the believer is able to confess that Jesus is Lord. A fundamental testimony of Christianhood. Really, one of the earliest creeds is, can you, if you can only say Jesus is Lord by the power of the Spirit. Abba prayer wells up from the spirit of sonship in believers. To be in Christ and in spirit are virtually synonymous. So the spirit cannot be experienced apart from Christ. These aren't two separate missions. These independent players, they are working in concert with each other. The spirit, like with Mary, always leads people and displays Jesus. The Spirit is always bringing Jesus forth. Now, that may not look like our conventional or typical picture. So we have to be careful in not demanding that the Spirit do something in the way that we think the Spirit has to do to reflect what we think Jesus has to be. And there's cautiousness there. But we have to be open to what the Spirit is doing and reactive to how Jesus is choosing to be exemplified in a context. Along with soteriology, the Spirit is also crucial for charismatic endowment and gifting. The Spirit gives gifts. The Spirit forms us into the body of Christ. And it is as the body of Christ that we're all working together. We're all equals in contribution, even though we have distinctions in role and apparent visibility or value, what have you. But there's everyone is a part of this process. There's not a passive group who are being led by the active participants. There's everyone in the church is called and gifted to be an inherent part. Otherwise, something will be lacking.
Another is experience of illumination, divine revelation in the face of affliction. How do we find peace in suffering? How do we find hope in the problems of chaos or destruction? How do we find the way to go when everything seems dark or that there doesn't seem to be an open door? The Spirit guides us in the darkness. The Spirit is the light. The Spirit gives us peace when everything seems overwhelming. And this is the spirit of the new age. The spirit, we can say, is rewriting the narrative of the world in the context of the old narrative. So what the spirit is doing is the inbreaking of the kingdom. When Jesus said, the kingdom is upon you and then sends the spirit, we see the spirit putting into place the characteristics of the coming kingdom, even before we have this, a, a separation of the end of history. The spirit is like like a, a fractal creation, a from below welling up and from within and transforming so that all things will be drawn back into God's narrative. It begins even now. Down payment of the glory to come. First installment. It's great imagery. There's also a moral transformation. The, the spirit in the New Testament is the Holy Spirit. And we have to see the, the Holy Spirit is the presence of God. So where the presence of God is transforms into a relationship with God and being transformed into a relationship with God, we become the kind of people who relate to and with God. Holy isn't just a characteristic of God, it's a characteristic of the Spirit's work. The, the Spirit makes things holy. Now, what is holiness? Now, that's, a, that's another worthwhile study because holiness in conventional terms often means separation or legalism. Holiness churches tend to be known for legalism. I come from, a, come from that tradition in part myself. And so we have to see holy as itself. Jesus is holy. And Jesus was born. Jesus lived. Jesus taught. Jesus engaged people. Holy is essentially living in light of God's narrative in full. What does it mean to be holy? It means being in tune with God. Well, the Holy Spirit does that. But we're caught between these two narratives. We're caught between these two stories and we're caught between two different poles. There's, there, we have a cacophony of different narratives trying to demand our intention and identity. Well, which identity are we going to hold on to? Are we going to identify with these systems of the world or are we going to identify with God's call and spirit? And yet the systems of the world seem a lot more immediate and a lot more demanding at times. So the believer has the responsibility to deliver her his or her life and the power of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. Uh, discernment is a constant process, a daily interaction with God. And as we grow in God, the fruit of the Spirit then becomes evident. And we'll talk about this in light of orthopathy in a few weeks. The rest of the New Testament pastoral letters seem to be shy about the manifested Spirit's ministry in the church and link it closely with long-standing giftings to the ministry as well as to the inspiration of Scripture. So you can see this organizational containment of the Spirit beginning a little early. Again, these, these were contextual letters, so we don't want to read too much into the dynamic experience of the church. These are ways of, of providing guidance and pastoral direction in moments of questioning. And yet, later on, more dynamic elements get left behind. You have these, and so it can easily seem like this is all there was. Titus 3.5 connects the Holy Spirit with regeneration. The book of Hebrews knows, clearly knows about the charismatic vitality. Earlier times, and inspiration of scripture is, is a main theme. Tapping into the God's revelation throughout the scriptures is for part. Tapping into the Torah, essentially. The, it's an old, the Hebrews is this wonderful expression of Old Testament theology being transfigured into New Testament revelation. And so it draws on those themes. The book does connect the Spirit with Christ's self-offering on the cross, expanding the Spirit Christology. So like the Old Testament, the Spirit doesn't show up a huge amount, but where it shows up, it's absolutely, literally crucial. The letters of Peter connect the Spirit with inspiration. First Peter makes an important connection between the Spirit and our suffering as Christians. Our living out the narrative of Christ in the context of the world puts us in contrast at times with the other narratives. And those other narratives, those other systems then respond accordingly. But it's not because God has left us, it's because we are living in this contrast way that is a prophetic posture in this world. Spirit orients us within the narrative of the kingdom, and that's resisted by those who want to continue the narrative of the world. Don't be surprised if the world resists you because you're walking with the Spirit. But at the same time, don't assume that the resistance is just because you're walking with the Spirit. Sometimes we're just being jerks. <laughs> right? The issue of discernment, we don't have an instant validation just because we can call ourselves Christian. We have to be attentive in all those things that I talked about before, the moral transformation, the, the fruit of the Spirit. All these things also are part and parcel of the Spirit expression. In as much as we're living these things out, as the world resists us, we should see this as a sign of our good favor. But the resistance itself, we have to be cautious. We may be using spirit language to justify alternative worldly narratives. Now, the church has gotten caught in that throughout history. And we can see that even in, in some indications now, there's that continued struggle. 
We also can talk about spirit and spirits, lowercase, by meaning there's a cosmology of God's spirit, the human spirit, and these other, we can call them demonic forces. The New Testament recognizes spirits besides the spirit of God. It recognizes the reality of a battle going on between the kingdom of God and evil spirits. This conflicting narratives isn't just part of our physical reality, but the New Testament extends us in a broader way beyond our experience of this physical world. It's depicted especially in the Synoptic Gospels, but you certainly see it throughout. You see that this battle warfare, we're, we're, we're caught in this struggle. We're not innocent victims. We're not passive participants. We're instead participants who are able to enter into either side and in sometimes in a way that we try to play both sides, which doesn't work, which Paul warns against. The early church continued this understanding. They're good spirits and bad. The church and individual Christians, Christians need to be able to discern the spirits. The early, some early Christian literature talked about discernment being the most important gift of all because how do we know what God is doing and where God is doing when there are times in which a certain action may be right and may be wrong depending on what, what we're supposed to do. Are we supposed to resist the government? Or are we supposed to accept the leadership of the government as given by God? Well, depending on what we see in the time of God's work, that could have an alternative purpose. Sometimes Paul took the punishment for being a missionary. Sometimes Paul made an issue of his being a Roman citizen. Well, how do we know which is which? You know, go down the list of, of uh, contextual issues today. How do we discern the spirit? What, is, what does God want us to do? How should we evangelize someone? Should we make someone feel guilty and talk about hellfire? Or should we invite them in and maybe just accept them and get, never get around to talking about Jesus? Now, how do we navigate the different issues and concerns of a given situation? Jesus had a very dynamic way of interacting with particular people, depending on that particular person's story and history, always in a way that was effective. So how do we become effective in light of knowing that we are going to be pulled in a lot of different directions? Sometimes we're going to be pulled in the way of the spirit, but we're also pulled by our own ego. We're also pulled by demonic forces, we can say, that want to undermine us often by using the very tools we think are necessary. That's a dangerous issue. And again, it's something we see throughout church history. The very tools of scripture Satan used to lead Jesus into temptation. When Jesus was, was in the temptation in the wilderness, both of them were, were really battling against scripture. Was using scripture good? Yes. And yet Satan used, used, was using scripture to pull Jesus away from his mission. And the church has done this too. We get deceived and we get drawn into being antichrists, even as we put on the pose of being pro-Christ.